I'd like to welcome you all to the Heritage Room and to introduce Miriam Ben Yakov. Hi, thank you for coming. I hope you'll enjoy tonight. I'm going to read three short stories. They are all based on, the, they are set rather in South Africa, the country in which I grew up. And the stories will talk for themselves. The first story, The Hillbrow Incident, is set in Johannesburg about 10, 15 years ago. Okay. The Hillbrow Incident. Two bus stops away, one bus stop away. She rose, tucked at the stop cord, then carefully descended the curved staircase of the lurching, red, double-decker bus. She stepped to the pavement, eager to start her weekly merging into Hillbrow, a suburb of Johannesburg. As she passed the Degamo Cafe, she swerved to avoid the arc of dirty water a calf maid threw into the street gutter. Sorry, Missy, the maid said. Adjoining the neighboring man's clothing store was a tiny cobbled courtyard. Therein grew one lovely tree. Stone steps led up to a yellow canopied entrance. No display window here. Instead, there was a small oval peephole, just big enough to wet one's curiosity through its revelation of a custom-made suit. A snooty porcelain cat lounged on artfully draped wool. A few graceful silk ties away, bright yellow chrysanthemums grew in an imported Italian pot. Hillbrow had awakened, had been washed and groomed. The roads were bumper to bumper with parking place seekers. Green mamba buses had already spewed out the multitude of black workers that they compacted into Johannesburg from the township. The traffic light turned green. The mass, brown, black, and white, surged onward. The African sun rose higher, vaporizing the dewdrops, making the day heavy. The fruit store's colorful display of mangoes, football-sized papaya, trays of brown, pox-scared lychees, and beautiful, pale pink guavas made Anna's stomach rumble. Should she buy a Granny Smith, a bunch of cave grapes? She scrutinized the fruit carefully and settled on some lychees and three large guavas. One doesn't eat on the street. It is unladylike, she kept reminding herself, but to no avail. She could imagine the gravelly texture of the guava, feel its pips crack against her teeth. Her hand slipped into the brown bag. She took a fugitive bite of the unwashed fruit, hurriedly replaced the bitten fruit in the bag, wiped her mouth with the back of her hand, and walked on. At a still-closed car park, a sleepy attendant sat against the wall. His eyes were shut. His feet were stretched out across the pavement, blocking the flow of pedestrians. He must be waiting for the white boss to come and unlock the door, Anna thought. A footstep or so passed the attendant, Anna stopped. She was almost knocked off her feet as the woman who had been walking behind her bumped into her. Anna, picking up the woman's purse out of the gutter and handing it to her, apologized. The woman hurried on, and Anna's eyes returned to the attendant. He seemed familiar. She knew him. Back home on the farm. Yes, it was Samson, the headman's son. Greetings, Samson. What are you doing in Johannesburg? Samson lifted his shoulder blade. He did not look up at her. Last I heard you were at the mission school, she continued. She saw people walking past, looking at her, and then down at the young black man sitting against the wall. Samson did not look up at Anna. He clenched and unclenched his fist. fist. Samson, it's all right to greet me. What are you doing here? Why aren't you at school? Minutes seemed to pass before he looked up at the waiting young woman, his eyes squinting in anger, and a swallow startled. Samson rolled a bit of chewing tobacco around in his mouth, then spat it into the dust. His shoulders arched. She could feel the power barely concealed. Damn you, white woman. Why do you talk to me, he said finally through clenched teeth. His lips compressed into a tight, thin line. He bent forward to tie his shoelace. What do you mean, she said, watching. 
not quite sure what to do. When Samson straightened, he said, Because of the books, I see it is different in other countries. What do you mean? Anna said again. She shifted her weight. Every time something about me or my people not being equal is said, I feel as if a red-hot branding iron is forced into my forehead. So you got into trouble. You ran away. Yes, a surprised upward glance. How did you know? You will tell them where I am, Samson queried. Of course not, silly. What has it to do with me? Do you have permission to work in Johannesburg? His stare was frozen into pure hatred. What if I have or don't have permission? What's it to you, he asked. You'll get caught. That's what, Anna said, tossing her head in the air. Goodbye. He smiled sardonically, obviously relieved to see her go. She walked past the OK bazaars, barely looking at the department store windows. She felt confused by the meeting with Samson. She had planned later, together with her friends, she would sniff the perfume, touch the silk scarf, experiment with a new makeup, and perhaps buy a hair comb. Now she did not feel so sure. Jan, Anna's brother, worked next door at Radio Manny. Radio Manny, a long, narrow store, had two display windows on either side of its entrance. These windows were crammed full, one with every available radio and tape recorder, the other window with every imaginable camera, lens, and tripod. Each piece displayed had an orange card before it. In Jan's neat print, these cards declared the sacrifice price and the original price. Jan, tall and thin, stood behind the counter, preparing next week's offerings on more nauseating orange cards. Manny's wife was reading the morning paper. Soon her twin sister would be coming to help with the expected Saturday morning rush. Jan looked up, saw Anna, and smiled. You're early today. Yes, it's such a lovely day. I didn't want to wait for Francis and Marie. I arranged to meet them at 11.30. Anna hesitated a little, and Jan looked at her. What is it, he said. They could always read each other's moods. I saw Samson, she said. Petrus' son? Yes. He's working as an attendant at that car park up the road, and he's going to get into trouble. He has no past. He quit mission school and came here. He's so arrogant, he'll stick out like a sore thumb. Yes, I know, Jan said. He drew a deep breath. I'd better get back to work. I'll wait for you at one o'clock, and then we can talk some more. Anna walked to the street corner, looked right, then left, crossed the road and entered the concrete, steel and glass bookstore. She walked past the two to three months old American and British magazines, past the aisle containing the Afrikaans books, to the center of the bookstore. She glanced at the books, Bushfell Country, Kalahari, the Kingdom of the Hemsbach, Natal, Province of Contrast. She picked up This Is South Africa and paged through it until she came to the section which depicted the orange free state. She looked hungrily for the illustrations that included the Drakensberg Mountains. The broad rock bands of those rugged, overpowering peaks blazed brilliant orange, yellow, and red. These colors dimmed with distance to Anna's familiar misty purple blue. As she scanned the pages, the wide, friendly smiles of the Basutu blurred into the smiles of Petrus, Maria, Samson, and family. Recollections of skipping up the path to the mud hut near the railway line. Samson calling, come, follow me. Samson motioning to Anna to be quiet, looking in the grass tuft. A slate gray shape emerging from the grass and starting to run towards the two children, then away. Samson pushing some grass blades aside. The guinea fowl's eggs, six beautiful oval eggs, half the size of a regular hen's egg, and covered with delicate emerald blue specks. Miss, are you all right? Can I help you? The book clerk asked. What? Oh, no, no, I'm fine, thank you. Anna closed the book and put it down. She walked, still with unfocused eyes, bumping into browsers to the entrance of the bookstore. Her high heel caught in the doorway. She cursed, turned, and leaned backward to extract it from the door's narrow ridge. As she straightened, she stared, still unfocused, at a bigger man leaning against the storefront. He grinned at her. 
picked up his tin money can and shook it until the raucous noise deafened her. She stood paralyzed. His grin widened. He leaned forward, his glance inviting her to witness some marvel. Slowly, he lifted aside the tattered khaki trouser leg and revealed stump. Anna stared at the flesh and skin-covered bones. She felt sick. With both hands, he lifted his right stump slightly, moved it around a little, and then let it fall with a thud on the hard cement of the pavement. His body swayed into a stable position. Guiltily, Anna felt in her pocket for some coins, which she dropped in the bigger man's tin can. Thank you, Missy. He made an exaggerated upper body bow, his palms pressed together and raised to her in submission. Aimlessly, Anna meandered on, looking into store display windows. Hey, miss, hey there, come with us. To gangly used teased, half pleased, half frightened, Anna turned her warm cheeks away from their lured glances and studied the bedpan, crutches, hospital bed, and orthopedic braces behind the glass display pane. Oh, Lord, she thought. She gave a quick look in the youth's direction, saw they were still smirking, and resumed her inspection of bedpan, crutches, and orthopedic braces. After a while, the youth slept. She passed the more stores, but Anna never paid much attention to them. She crossed the road at the traffic light where bicycled messenger boys propped one leg while they waited for the traffic light to change. Then round the corner, a wider pavement now, and as anticipated, the Nguni women in their bright blankets were already squatting on flattened cardboard boxes. Their wares were spread on faded tablecloths in front of them. Behind them, an electric display advertising Pac-Man winked. A woman picked up a salad bowl carved from imbuya wood. She held it towards Anna, who patted her pocket and smiled at the woman to show her she had no money. She did not speak the woman's language. Far off, shouting could be heard. What could it be? Has somebody been pickpocketed? The shouting drew nearer. At the traffic light, the messenger boys, who were a moment ago exchanging pleasantries, cursed as they were pushed aside by shoving hands and butting shoulders. Head thrust forward like a ramming device, Samson flew through. Anna's mouth became dry, her stomach cramped. So soon, she thought. People who were not quick enough to move out of Samson's way got knocked aside like tenpins. Closer and closer behind him, the police came. One of the Nguni women's carefully displayed beadwork, wire, bead dolls, doilies, beaded gauze and seed necklaces, scattered into the street, trampled under. Aye, she wailed. Aye, my children's supper is being trampled. Indifferent to the running man and the pursuing police, she bent forward to scoop up her wares. A policeman tripped over her bending form. Damn woman, he yelled as he got up and continued running. Someone yelled, we have him. The police walked back past the Nguni woman. Samson, even with his hands cuffed behind him, resisted fighting all the time. As he was being pulled past her, Anna and Samson's eyes locked. She saw him falter and stumble. She turned her head aside. Moments later, she realized she had clasped one of the Nguni woman's forearms. She mumbled an apology and walked on towards the flower stand. It was over. Shop assistants, who had been drawn to the doors by the noise, shrugged their shoulders. Witnessing Black shuffled along, their chatter momentarily silenced. The Nguni woman collected the scattered doily, dolls, gauze, and necklaces that once were a bright kaleidoscope of colors on the gray cement pavement. One Black, another illegal, she thought, unglued himself from a shop front, walked towards the nearest alley, and urinated against the wall. Anna fled to the flower stand. Many waterfall pails were evenly placed on long wooden planks balanced on bricks. Sterilitia, the bird of paradise, with purple beak and orange mane, carnations in bundles of red, pink, and white. Wild, deep blue cornflowers triggered memories of childhood summers. Molly, her long dead terrier, sniffing Anna's legs as she gathers these delicate blue beauties. White lace flowers. Delicate, large, Anna's eyes quickly darted to safer blooms, to roses, big and small, a pale of greenery. 
Then the many varieties of chrysanthemums, large, frothy white hairs, the conventional brown rust, yellows and whites. The stall owner, a tall Indian in pale blue safari suit, seemed to know Anna was one of the fools who gape but don't buy. He understood and moved on. His sarried wife glanced over her shoulder, her hands high in the air, trimming dead growth from a hanging fern. Large, intelligent eyes in a brown face, black hair pulled sternly back into a bun. Tiny diamonds studded her ears. Anna! Marie and Francis were waving at her. She took one last look at the flowers. Knowing she had to meet her friends, she moved, trance-like, toward them. The second story, The Felt Fire, is part of a novel in progress. It is set in a rural area at the time, just after the Second World War, and it's at this part that I'm reading is the beginning of the novel, we're getting to know the character of the little girl, Ilana, to see what she is like as a person. There are two words you need to know. Paraffin means kerosene, and tokolosi is witch doctor's familiar. The felt fire. Did you bring the matches? Joey smiled, reached into her pocket, handed the box of matches to Ilana, who opened it, took a match, and rubbed the sulfur-coated head between her fingertips. Have you used any, she asked. I wanted to show them to you first, Joey replied. The grass is dry. If they catch us with the matches, we'll get into trouble, Ilana said as she threw the box of matches to Joey. They won't know, Joey said, pocketing the matches and running across the top of the copy. Ilana followed her. As they tumbled to the grass, Ilana asked, Joey, will you really light the matches? Sure. A small fire. Joey smiled, drew a match from the box and lit it. Ash white smoke rose in a thin curved line, then petered as she dropped the match. Let me! Anna's fingers, Ilana's fingers trembled as she pushed the match against the side of the box. The tip burst into flame with a swishing sound, but the flame died when she moved her hand. My turn, Joey said, rearing for the box of matches. Mine hasn't lit yet, Ilana said, swinging the matches out of Joey's reach. Hurry, Joey grumbled. Ilana lit a match, then slowly opened her cupped hand. She too held the match till the heat hurt before dropping it. The grasses bending to the wind was momentarily interrupted by the crackle and snarl of a small flame rising from its white gold base. This is fun, she laughed. Uh, bending forward to brush away the dust and cinders clinging to her legs. Ma will be mad at me for getting dirty, she added, seeing a black spot on her skirt. Your ma and pa are funny. They don't punish you. They just talk, 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 Joey said. Yeah, that way I can never forget all I did wrong, Ilana sighed. Never mind, Joey said, taking Ilana by the arm. Wash in the reservoir. It's dirty. Course it. It hasn't rained in a long time, Joey said stepping into the cement overfill from which the cattle drank. Pa says we're lucky to still have water, she said, raising dust clouds with her toes. She bumped into Ilana. Laughing, the girls steadied themselves, climbed out the trough, and ran in circles, arms wide like birds' wings, till they were dry. How come you were late for school, Joey asked. You didn't hear? Ilana was surprised. No, what happened? Freak lightning struck the haystack, Ilana whispered, rolling up into her stomach. It was almost as light as day, like the Bantu say it's when the witch doctors send the tokolosi. Joey rubbed the goose flesh on her arm. Yeah, Ilana said. It must have been tokolosi's work, because there was no rain, and after all the hay burned, the ground still flamed. Big flame. She put her hands up over her eyes to shut out the sun. Ma was crying. She kept saying, so close to winter. It looked pretty. I'd never seen such big flames. That's easy, Joey said. Ilana looked at her. I can get a bottle of paraffin. Paraffin makes big flames. Old Anna spilled some when she filled the primers. 
the flames caught on the spilled paraffin and burned her forearm. If your ma notices the bottles of paraffin missing, she'll think one of the girls took it, Ilana said. So what? Joey, there are lots of other girls on the farm. Ma can always tell them to come work. They walked to the farmhouse. While waiting in the kitchen for Joey, Ilana heard something heavy fall and shatter on the linoleum floor. She turned and saw the Rob's big black cat curl up on the rimpy stool. He must have come in through the window and pushed the potted geranium off its saucer. He looks like the leopard the witch doctor changes into when he goes to steal children's entrails. Only smaller, she thought. Her heart was still beating fast when Joey returned with a bottle of paraffin hidden under her blouse. They crept out the kitchen, then ran to the top of the copy where Joey wiggled the cork stopper off the paraffin bottle. She poured about a quarter of the paraffin over the grass replaced the stopper and lay the bottle down some yards away. Ilana lit a match. It flared into an elongated teardrop which fell towards the darkened, wetted grass. A moment of nothingness, then a flare, pretty, like the water fountain in the town's park, all the water reaching upward to a single point. Ilana stood, straight as a fence post, her fists tightly clenched, a few paces away, Joey stood, chewing on a strand of hair. A moment, eternity. Then with a whoop of joy, the girls attacked the flames. They stamped up and down till they had vanquished them. Should we try a bigger area? They looked at one another. Yeah, we can control it, Ilana said, then stopped. We'd better get branches. As Ilana stretched upwards and grabbed one of the low branches, she felt somebody watching. She turned and saw a Bantu leaning on his nocturne, staring at them. She felt dizzy and clung to the branch. Joey didn't see the Bantu and grabbed the same branch. Swaying back and forth, the girls pulled at the branch. It tore from the tree trunk. The girls fell backwards onto the ground. They lay a few seconds, stunned. When their wind returned, they jumped up and broke off another, smaller branch. Both branches were dragged to the burnt grass, then dropped near the bottle of paraffin. Ilana looked for the Bantu, but he had disappeared. Joey pulled the cork stopper out, turned the bottle sideways, and starting at the blackened patch, walked in a circle, pouring paraffin over the grass. Ilana lit a match and dropped it on the glinting grass. Nothing happened. Joey came and stood against the wind, acting as a buffer. Ilana tried again. Still the matches fell. The flames extinguished before they reached the grass. The girl squatted. Joey cupped her hands around the flame. It thrived. Ilana gently lowered it to the ground. Joey's cupped hands followed. The flame grew, snatching and snarling at the dampened grass. The girls watched as an arrow of light ran along the dark trail left by the paraffin before bringing their branches down on the flames. The flames grew like frowns of yellow-white ferns. They hit the flames with the same zeal that the Bantu laborers used to beat wrinkled snakes to death. Yet the flames, like arms bent in invitation, slipped out from under their branches and beckoned them nearer from a little further away. This fire's bloody difficult to put out, Ilana said, wiping her nose against the back of her arm. What if we can't put out the fire, Joey asked. There's no can't, Ilana said. But the grass was drunk with paraffin. Ilana's legs were searing where the flames had nipped at her. She looked around. Already there was a burnt area about as big as a hen hop, and no matter how much she and Joey tried, the fire slipped past them. We must get help, she said, grabbing Joey's hand. Joey drew back. They'll know we started the fire, she said. We'll say it was Piccanini. Two Piccaninis, Ilana said, dragging Joey, who resisted and fell. Ilana helped her up and in a calmer voice said, Come! We must get help. They both ran, shouting, Fire! Fire! Help! As they came close to the house, the servants streamed into the backyard. One of the women let out a piercing scream and pointed towards the darkening north sky. A buzzing of voices started and cold looks were thrown at the two girls. What happened? Anna, the old ironing girl, asked. A fire, Ilana forced out. The sight felt like a blunt knife had been jabbed in and held in a tight line of pain. A fire, Joey repeated, swallowing to remove the tearing in her throat. We saw two piccaninis playing with matches. An 
angry murmurs swept through the servants' ranks. Mrs. Robb, Joey's mother, walked out the house. Quiet, she commanded, lifting her hand, then looked at the two girls. What's this about, she asked. A fire, Joey said, looking scornfully at the servants. We saw two piccaninis playing with matches and chased them away. Yeah, Ilana continued, the grass is burning. We couldn't put out the fire. Again, an angry murmur, like bees whose nest has been disturbed, broke out. Never mind that now, Mrs. Rock said, looking round. Where's Timothy? Here, Missies, a black youth, about 16 years old, stepped forward. Go, call the bar, tell him what happened, Joey's mother said. Yes, Missies, he said, turned and jogged to the Millie land. Joey's mother then called the maids to come and help. There was no need. Old Anna and Jemina, the house girl, had already gone to collect empty burlap bags and were now at the water pump. Jemina, crooning softly, was pumping. The underpart of her upper arm swayed back and forth as she lifted, then lowered the pump handle. Anna used a wooden axe handle to move the burlap bags around in the aluminum bath. Missies, Missies, please can I go take my children away from the kraal? The cook, her hands clenched, stood in front of Mrs. Robb. The smoke looks near the kraal, she said. The men drove up in the jeep. Mrs. Robb pointed towards the smoke. Yeah, we know, Timothy told us, Mr. Robb shouted through the jeep window as Petrus and Salimo jumped off the back and ran to the water pump. They pulled the aluminum bath filled with wet burlap bags to the jeep. Other workers helped them lift the bath onto the back of the jeep next to the branches torn from the willow trees. Joey's brother turned the jeep in a half circle, then drove towards the fire. Missies, please! Mrs. Robb looked at the cook. She had forgotten about her. Yeah, go get the children. Bring them to the house, she said. Since nothing was happening at the house, Joey and Ilana decided to go to the fire. They heard the crackling of the flames and felt the heat on their cheeks and chests. The black spot had grown so large they could not see its end. The workers' deep bass voices evoked battle songs which crescendoed with the down sweep of their arms and the swish of the burlap sacks and willow branches. Their unified voices dragged their tired limbs beyond feeling into repetitive, mechanical, downward thrashing. Ilana watched a lorry approach. It was Mr. Bjorker, the Rob's neighbor, she did not want him to see her and hid behind the workers. I saw the smoke clouds and thought you needed help, Mr. Burkus said. Thank God, Mr. Rob replied. It was decided that Mr. Burkus would build a firebreaker on his side of the boundary. Mr. Burkus's lorry grumbled and lurched the hundred and fifty yards to the boundary, then shuddered to a stop. Mr. Burkus and a worker cut the barbed wire. Two younger workers rolled it into bundles and pushed them to one side. As Mr. Bukas drove the lorry through the opening just cut, then stopped ten yards further, the girls reached the fence. There they hid behind a petrol drum, sawn in half and filled with a coarse salt which the cattle loved to lick. The firebreaker was lit, and like a frightened calf, herded gently to trail upward and over the copy in a straight line, four foot across. The sounds of the real fire came closer, and Joey and Ilana ran back before anybody noticed they were missing. The head boy looked up, saw the girl, then the firebreaker behind them. With a hoarse voice, he told the others. They let out a wild, tired cheer. The sun was setting. Joey's mother and the cook came with pots of hot, sweet, milky coffee and trays of thick sandwiches. Thin strips of apricot jam cut through the white bread. Assured of success, the workers laid down their branches and burlap bags, then stretched their hands out for the sandwiches. They ate sitting on their haunches, then waited for mugs of steaming coffee. The wind changed. It took the fire and leaped over the firebreaker. A human wail blended into it. The camaraderie, the excitement was dashed and submerged tiredness reared despondently. The men cursed, spat into the charred remains around them, swilled the last dregs of coffee from the mug, and returned them to the cook with a donkey sister. Let's go home, Joey whispered to Ilana. Shouldn't we help, Ilana said. Nah, Joey said. She grinned. It's the biggest fire I ever saw. Entering the yard, 
they heard Mrs. Rapp's voice carry across the night air. Yeah, Andres, it's bad, yeah. Yeah, we thought we had it. Then that predomptive wind rose again and pulled it right across Bukas' firebreaker. Yeah, I guess he didn't make it wide enough. Yeah, could you start a breaker on your side? Ilana couldn't understand why one needed to start a fire to put out a fire. It didn't make sense. Ilana also knew about the party line and that by tomorrow morning everybody would know about the fire. She whispered her fear to Joey. What do you think, Joey said. They don't have to listen in on the party line. They just have to open their eyes and look. The whole sky for miles around is lit up. Bunty children sat on the veranda. Ilana feigned tiredness and ignored children she and Joey usually played with. She soon lay curled up, her head cushioned on her upper arm, asleep. She woke to feel her shoulder being shaken. She opened her eyes and saw Mrs. Rob bending over her. Come, Mrs. Rob said. I spoke to your mother. You'll sleep here tonight. The fire, Ilana mumbled in her sleep. It's over. Come to bed, Mrs. Rob said gently. The bitter smell of charcoal irritated the inside of Ilana's nose. Around them workers gathered their children. Tired goodbyes were muffled against parents' smoke-smelling shoulders. Joey and Ilana were steered towards Joey's room. There they fell back into sleep. The next morning, like any normal day, Joey and Ilana went to school. But Ilana did not feel so good. She hoped her parents didn't find out about the fire. Walking home after school, she hoped her parents would be out. But as she walked through the kitchen door, she saw them sitting at the dining table. She tried to smile. They dare not find out it was me and Joey, she thought. She wondered if Joey was feeling as scared as she was. She said she was not hungry and went to lie on her bed. Ilana woke with the feeling that someone was in the room. Prince, her cat, had pushed against the bed frame. He was half growling, half hissing at the doll. She thought she saw a small black man move near her doll. The Tukolosi, she thought, scooping Prince up and running to the bathroom. While washing her eyes with cold water, she could feel the Tokolosi at her side, waiting. She had to get out. What if they find out? What will they do to us? The questions rolled over and over in her head. Later, as she always did at this time of day, she walked towards the milking kraal. There, unable to look her father in the eyes, she mumbled a greeting, then sat against a milk can scratching in the dust between her spread legs with a broken twig. As the calves were steered towards their mothers, Ilana went to fetch the two hoes. Her father called. Ilana, we are not going for a walk tonight. She replaced the hoes against the stone wall, her cheek tight, her breath slow, small, her chest tight, her breath slow, small. Ilana, why did you say two Picanini started the fire, her father asked. It was, it was, Ilana sobbed. Two of them, Joey and me, we saw them. Stop it. His voice had grown hard with anger. You know I hate lying. She lowered her head. Mr. Rob called this morning. A bunch who saw you and Joey playing with matches. Her eyes went big with fear. She looked at her father. We didn't mean to start the fire. She wanted him to believe her. We were only playing with matches, seeing how far we could let the fire burn before we put it out. You know how dangerous fires are, he said. Ilana wanted to run into his arms, to be held and told that everything was all right. She tried to talk to him, to make him warm. He raised the collar of his khaki wind jacket, turned and walked towards the house. Ilana clenched her fist. At least Joey's dad will use a shambok, she thought. It'll burn and sting and she will not be able to sleep on her back for a few days. But when the sore goes and she can sit again, it'll be forgotten. She threw a stone with all her might, turned and walked towards the witch doctor's hut. Last one. <laughs> the last one is very short. And it is based on a true story. It's called Retif Kop. 
The overalls flapped around the hulk of what had once been a strong poor farmer. The big bones remained, the flesh sunken, cavernous. Retief could not quieten, could not settle until the eight-year-old Bantu boy each day led him up the steep mountain path and then watched over him as he sat in the shade under the overhanging cliff, staring out over the sheer drop. Only then did his eyes, blank as the sky into which he stared, rest from their continual shifting. Retief's senility had come suddenly, without warning, and had come because he had done what any good parent would have done. He had shot his son. The mountain, after the event, was renamed Retief Corp. It happened during an unusually stormy summer. That afternoon the storm clouds had again gathered. Niels, the second youngest, in what had become a ritual, went to herd the merino sheep down the mountain to safety. He did not return. The rest of the family, as was their habit, waited out the storm in the farmhouse kitchen. Niels's mother was the first to hear Niels's dog scratch at the kitchen door. The dog would not enter, but stood, whined, wagged his tail, then walked away. Understanding something had happened to Neil, Retief and the two elder sons went to look for him. After an hour's trek up the mountain, where the elbow of the mountain curved into a valley of sweet grass, they found the sheep huddled together. They called to Neil, but their words were swept away by the wind. The dog whined, wanting them to go further up the mountain. A sheep must have strayed. Why didn't he leave it and bring the rest of the sheep down, Retief mumbled. The path wound between sandstone cliffs, then flattened into smaller, hidden valleys of sweet grass, valleys marked by boulders that had cracked off the cliffs and rolled down. The dog would wait until Retief and his two sons were close, then continue. He led them to an overhanging cliff. There he began barking. His barking disturbed a sheep that was sheltered in the cave-like indentation. This confirmed what they feared, that Niels had followed the sheep, frightened of the thunder and lightning, up the mountain. Why did he not leave the sheep be, Retief mumbled, always a dreamer. At 16, one would think he had enough sense to know not to go scrambling across boulders when it is raining and there is little light. He probably is lying in a gully with a broken leg, Kleinhans muttered. Retief cupped his hands around his mouth. Niels, he shouted. Niels, can you hear me? The wind moaned in reply. Kleinhans and Franz alternated calling and shining their torches over the ledge. We can't do anything until daylight, Franz said. You go down. At first light, bring ropes, spades, hammer and pegs. Bring brandy. Retief peered into the dark abyss. I'll stay. The wind might die down. Then, when I call, Niels will be able to hear me. Retief shouted in the cave-like indentation formed by the boulder and overhang. At daybreak, the brothers, followed by their mother, reached the flay where the sheep huddled. The sky was a clear blue with wisps of clouds except for the many streams running down the mountain and the grass matted heavy with rain. No trace of yesterday's storm remained. They found Retief at the boulder, pacing the path, tapping his hand around his mouth, calling to Neil, then hand behind ear, listening. The cliffs echoed, Neil! 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 Once or twice he thought he heard a faint reply. Go home. This is no place for a woman, Retief said when he saw his wife. It's my son. Her chin was firm, thrust out. I want to help. Go home. Retief's voice was cracking. Go home. Call Dr. Holmes. Prepare a bed, hot water, bandages. She stood. Franz, Retief called. Take your mother home. Franz tugged at his mother's hand. Come, Ma. We'll do the best we can. She looked at her husband. 
Go, woman, call the doctor, prepare the house. She whispered, God be with you, and turned. Even while she was talking, Franz and Ken Hans were scouring the cliffs below, looking for any sign of movement. Ken Hans thought he saw something moving in the cliffs below. Retief came and looked through the binoculars. Yeah, I see his hat, and a little further to the left, a scrap from his jacket. He returned the binoculars to Ken Hans. Franz, you act as a safety. I'll climb down. But Pa, if he is that far down, we cannot just lower you. The rope will rub against the sandstone, fray, perhaps even break under your weight. We need trusses. The job was tedious. Ken Hans and Franz hammered sawn off fence posts down and down the side of the sandstone cliff toward the crevice. Retief peered through the binoculars. In the quiet between hammer blows, faintly they heard, Help! Franz and Ken Hans began hammering like madmen. Slower, Retief commanded. Control the pace, else you too are likely to go tumbling down the cliffs. He's here, Pa, fallen in! Franz and Ken Hans shouted, hammering the last fence post within arm's reach of the sandstone crevice. We're coming to get you, Retief shouted, coiling rope across his shoulder and back. He motioned for the two brothers to come up so he could climb down. On reaching the crevice ledge, mindful not to look at the drop below, Retief swiveled around, then peered into the dark crevice. He could see Niels' head and shoulders. Niels! Can you hear me? he asked. Pa, hang on, Niels. We're going to get you out, Retief said. As Retief was trying to figure out how to bring Niels up, Franz let out a cry. Retief prayed it was not us fools, vultures. Angrily he muttered, not my son. Turning painstakingly, he yelled up the cliff, Franz, get the point two two. Shoot any bloody us fool that gets too smart and comes close. Niels? Can you move your head, your shoulders? Retief asked once he had changed position. Yeah, Pa. Your arms? My left hand a little. It's sore and pushed back. The rocks seem to be getting tighter to be pushing in on me, Neil said. Retief understood the sandstone was swelling with rain. I'm thirsty, Pa, Niels whispered. Soon, son, soon, Retief replied cautiously unwinding the rope, rolled around his shoulder, then lowering it into the crevice. Grab the rope! I can't move, Pa, Neil sobbed. Try, man! Neil sounded angry. I can't! Catch it with your mouth, then, Retief replied. For a moment, Neil had the rope in his mouth. Retief tugged, pulled, while commanding Neil not to let go. Neil seemed to lift, then sagged. Rest a while, then we try again, Retief said. There was no reply. Niels, Retief called, but Niels had lost consciousness. Franz returned with a point two two. He did not need to use it. The Aspel, patient creatures, were in no hurry and kept their distance. Niels intermittently regained consciousness. He was in excruciating pain. Round midday, he began begging his father to shoot him. Retief had tried everything he could think of, but could find no way to lift Niels out from the crevice. The doctor and some neighboring farmers had gathered on the ledge next to the St. Hans and Franz. The district police sergeant and his black constable arrived. By the second day, every time Niels gained consciousness, he would beg to be shot. He moaned that he could not stand the thirst and the pain. By the third day, there was growing consensus among the group gathered on the ledge that shooting was the only alternative. The sergeant gave official approval. Retief held out till the fourth day. Then, as the sun was beginning to set and Niels was again moaning in pain, Retief asked for the revolver to be lowered to him.
coming, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>